Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Better yet, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, welcome to the Great California Cab Shootout Part 3. I've got a collection of six Cabernet Sauvignons from the 2016 Vintage in California. Everything from an entry-level California Appalachian to a luxury wine from the Diamond Creek AVA in Napa Valley. If you haven't watched part one that discusses why wines are priced the way they are, feel free to click, the, uh, click up here or somewhere and hit the link in the description and watch it. It's actually probably two parts. If you're like, nah, Mark, too long, didn't watch the thing, here's the skinny. A lot of the price is tied to location, 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 location. The more precise the location or the smaller the target, in general, the more expensive the grapes are and associated costs with that land. Add in materials other, and other factors like oak barrels and other winemaking costs and all the normal costs of running a business. Then economies of scale or production levels. If you haven't watched part two, that talks about each winery and the stats of each wine. Feel free to click up, free to click up here or here or wherever, or hit the link below. If you're not feeling that and just want the stats, well then keep watching. Okay, so here's the deal. I've got six 2016 Cali cabs at various price points. We got the Murphy Good, California for 10 bucks, Buena Vista Vin Vinicultural Society, uh, Sonoma County for 19. We've got the Silver Ghost, Napa Valley for 35. We got the Barnett Vineyards Premier for uh, in Napa Valley for 80 bucks. The Senegal Napa Valley for 110 dollars, and the Diamond Creek v uh, Vineyards Gravelly Meadow Diamond Mountain District for 250. Uh, well, this is uh, 375. They only cost me 130, but the two the 750 actually costs um, 250. Now on this one, I didn't put down Spring Mountain District in my in my um, script, but that's where this is coming from. All right, so my good friends here at High Street uh, Wine Company in the Pearl of San Antonio were kind enough to let me record this part after a Monday morning tasting group. Uh, they're going to take the wines, uh, they're going to take these wines behind me, use the Corvin to pour me a decent sample of each wine, and they're going to randomize the wines and then bring them back to me. Earlier today, we had our, our tasting group, uh, Mr. Scott Oda, coincidentally kind of did this comparison of quality and region. So I kind of got a preview of doing the same type of thing. I didn't do so hot though. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this is effectively a single blind. Now I know what the wines are, just not which glasses will be in which glass. My job is to rank the, these wines in order of quality and hopefully that will match the prices. I specifically, specifically chose wines I've never had. Of these six wines, I may have had a prior vintage of the same wine at some point, and it might have been this one, but I'm almost positive I've never had this one. Um, but, you know, the thing is, we taste wines all the time, so be it an industry tasting or a rep bringing it to taste, or maybe I happen to have a glass while I was out. You know, but as far as I know, I've never had any of these wines from any vintage. Not just that, I'm pretty sure I've never had any wine from any of these wineries in the past. Now I can tell you that this was kind of hard uh, because I bought these wines like two years ago and some of these wines I sell and I was always on the lookout for a rep bringing in a sample to taste and then having to tell them, no, nah, I can't taste it. Luckily, it never happened. All right, so while these wines are getting poured, uh, we're going to talk about uh, how those of us in the industry evaluate wines, uh, vine, wine versus say a critic. Since I do both, I can speak to both sides. When you're a wine buyer at a restaurant, bar, retail outlet, etc., you add wines based on a number of criteria. Many times after the rep brings a sample. Here are a few possible reasons. One, does it fill a hole in my list? Does it fulfill customer requests to carry the wine? Does it meet a profitability number? Does it meet a price point on the list? Is it too good of a deal to pass up? Like it's an iconic wine, highly allocated, something like that. Uh, maybe you just like the wine. Maybe it's a corporate mandate. Thank you, Boodles. Yeah. Uh, you don't always get to you don't always get to you know decide that, and you don't always get to try the wine ahead of time. Um, or you sometimes you're just doing the rep a favor. 
I mean, it's going to be a good wine. It's not going to be a crap wine, but sometimes, you know what? The rep's like, hey, can you help me out? And you say yes. In almost every case where the rep is bringing you a wine and you have, to, you have the ability to say no, and you're actually evaluating the wine, you know what the wine is. So you're not being brought the wine blind. Yes, there are psalms that will say they have reps taste them blind. I'm not necessarily calling BS, but that's a rarity. I've had reps do it because they know I like to do blinds, but again, this is, an ex this is extremely rare. When you know what the wine is and the rep is giving you the sales pitch, it's natural to let all of that influence what you think about the wine in both quality and whether you like it or not. There's even more pressure when the rep brings someone associated with the winery. It can be intimidating when that person is a master sommelier that you look up to. Sometimes it's the winemaker or the owner. A lot of times that's the same person. So now you have to decide if you're going to tell this person who's put everything into the wine or wines you just tasted, whether or not you're going to add any of them. So yeah, there is a lot of influence to think the wine is of a certain quality. Consumers feel the same thing when we give them a taste and give them the sales pitch or you go to the winery itself. All of that influences our opinion of the wine. For the wine critic, it all depends on how they receive the wine and the system they use. For someone like me, it's just me. I research each wine, do my best to ignore the actual tasting notes or any awards or scores. Just give me the facts about the wine. But reading about the winery and everything associated with it, and then knowing the retail of it, there are certain expectations. As a critic, I look at all of that when I taste the wine. I'm doing my best to evaluate the wine on its own. No story, no scores, no price. Is the wine well made? And is it typical of other wines from the same area? And then do I think that the wine is priced fairly? Blind tasting removes all of that. While you can make educated guesses about quality, you can be surprised. Winemakers do so much to influence the wine from vineyard to bottle. So even though this is not a double blind situation, this experiment, if you will, is valuable. Now, can I separate my thoughts on quality versus what I like? Will I correctly evaluate the wines based upon quality, price, and preference? Well, all three align. I could legitimately have three different rankings. And when we reveal the wines, there could be a fourth ranking. I don't know. I can assure you that I didn't pre-plan anything with the team at High Street, so I truly do not know what wine is in each glass. What's going to be the system? Well, I'm going to smell all six wines right down the line first. First, make sure all the wines are sound. However, this will give me a preview of them, and I'm sure I'll start making evaluations immediately. Next, I'll quickly evaluate each wine. I plan to take a couple minutes per wine. Do a more in-depth smell and then taste. Since I know they're all calves from Cali, I don't need to do a full-on deductive tasting. I'm literally just looking to rank them. After that second run-through, I'll probably do some side-to-sides. I'll give you my thoughts along the way. What I'm, looking for are in, uh, what I'm looking for are any additional notes or commentary about each wine. When I think I've done enough, then I'll rank each wine on three scales, quality, price, and preference. They all may be the same, but I'm going to try to separate it to three different levels, three different types of rankings. I'll then state my conclusions as to the identity of the wine in each glass. All right, so let's get the stats real quick in each wine. All right, so... We have the 2016 Murphy Good Cabernet Sauvignon for $10. It's from California. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon, of course. And being a state appellation, all that's required is 75% of the wine be Cabernet Sauvignon. Its ABV is 13.5%, and wine enthusiasts gave it 89 points. If you watched the episode prior to this, you realize that I never give points, except in this situation, I'm doing it for a reason. Uh, then we also have the 2016 Buena Vista Vinicultural Society Cabernet Sauvignon. Retails for $19. It's from the North Coast. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon. I don't know any percentages, but at least 85% of the grapes must come from the North Coast AVA, and at least 75% must be Cabernet Sauvignon. It is sourced from, they give us the sources, Fountain Grove District AVA, Sonoma Mountain AVA, Alexander Valley AVA, and then other North Coast areas. The ABV is 13.5%. The total acidity, or TA, is 5.6 grams per liter. The pH is 3.96. That's a little high. The RS is 2 grams per liter, and there were no ratings I found. We also have the 2016 Silver Ghost Cabernet Sauvignon for $35. It is at a Napa Valley. It is a blend of 90% Cabernet Sauvignon, 5% Cabernet Franc, 5% Petit Verdot. It is sourced from Rutherford, Calistoga, and Yountville. It is aged for 22 months. 
50% new French oak. Uh, ABV is 14.5%. It's 93 points from the tasting panel, 92 points from uh, 92 points are gold medal from San Francisco International Wine Competition, 91 points from Wilfred, Wong, Wilfred, Wilfred Wong. I always have a problem saying his name. Uh, he's basically the wine.com uh, critic. 90 points from wine enthusiast, enthusiast, decanter, and James Suckling. All right, so we also have a 2016 Barnett Vineyards Spring Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon. 80 bucks. Spring Mountain District, Napa Valley. It's a blend of 76% Cabernet Sauvignon, 11% Petit Verdot, 9% Merlot, 4% Cabernet Franc. They sourced all these from either their estate or from the York Creek Vineyards, uh, which is also in Spring Mountain. It's just not on their original property, but they do own the vineyard, which means they control everything about it. It is also aged for 22 months in French oak. It is 65% new, 35% two to five years old. The ABV is 14.6%. The total acidity is 7.2 grams per liter. The pH is 3.64. The RS is 1.25 grams per liter. I do have to thank Andy Barty for emailing me those last uh, few values from the winery. 105 barrels were made. So that's 2,025, 2,625 cases or 31,600 bottles. Ratings are 92 points for Wine Spectator, 91 points Robert Parker, AKA the Wine Advocate, Remember from last time, Robert Parker actually retired from, the, from reviewing wines in 2019 after he sold the Wine Advocate to a few years earlier. All right, then we also have the 2016 Senegal Estate Cabernet Sauvignon, retails for $110. It's from Napa Valley, just Napa Valley. It's a blend of 83% Cabernet Sauvignon, 6% Petit Verdot, 6% Malbec, and 5% Merlot fermented in 85% stainless steel, and the other 15% is an oak tank. No indication of like how new, or if it's just, you know, large vats or whatever. It is aged for 20 months in 85% new oak, oak type not specified. The ABV is 14.7%, 4,000 cases were produced or 48,000 bottles. Scores were 95 points Robert Parker, Wine Spectator, and uh, Jeb Dunnick. 92 points from James Suckling. And then we have the 2016 Diamond Creek Vineyards Gravelly Meadow. Meadow retails for $250, frets for the $750. Remember, the, the half bottle cost me $130. It is the Diamond Mountain District uh, AVA, Napa Valley. It is the Gravelly Meadow Vineyard, so vineyard specific. It is a blend of 88% Cabernet Sauvignon, 8% Merlot, 2% Cabernet Franc, and 2% Petit Verdot. The vineyard is five acres in size. We have an elevation, 550 feet. The soils are rocky, stony, and porous. The aspect is relatively flat. It's the meadow, it's not the hills, okay? It is hand harvested. Remember that. ABV is 14.5%. Here are the stats. 100 points, Robert Parker. 96 points, James Suckling. 95 points, Wine Spectator, Decanter, and Connoisseur's Guide. 94 points, Wilfred Wong and Wine Enthusiast and 92 points wine and spirits. I don't know which one of you is the Diamond Creek, but no pressure. All right, so without further ado, let's do this. All right, so I'm gonna be starting from my left, going to my right, and luckily the uh, guys at, at High Street labeled the, the wines one through six for me, so that in case I move things around, I don't forget that, and they also confirmed that they did it in the order I wanted. All right, so I'm gonna nose them all real quick, just to make sure everything's good. All right, all six are sound. We're, we're good to go with that. I didn't really pick up anything that just shot out at me like, oh my God, this is going to be the best wine or this is going to be the worst wine or anything in between. They all smelled like Cabernet Sauvignon or like smelled wine, let's put it that way. So we're gonna go through and kind of look at these real quick, smell them, taste them. I mean, I'm getting so, First wine, you know, got some uh, red fruit here. Mostly a raspberry, got, got a little blackberry on it. it. This is going to be the same for about every wine, just so you know. Uh, as far as, do I smell any oak? I might smell some oak on this, but I smell like a little bit of like coffee on it. I should touch a smoke, which is kind of, not weird, but I wasn't expecting. Tastes good. I get pretty much the same thing on the palate. You get the red and black fruits you're getting um, a little bit of that coffee. I'm getting a little bit of vanilla on this. 
a little bit of clove and cinnamon. So there are some spices there that might indicate there was some oak involved here, whether it's oak barrel or the cheaper wines probably are using something like oak chips or oak powder. So wine number two. Oh, thank you, sir. I don't know what that is, but it's there's something in it. <laughs> anyway, um, wine number two, I've got like, you know, again, red fruits. I kind of smell some alcohol in it. Some was a, sometimes, you know, high alcohol wines, you can smell it. So there might be something to that. I don't know. But it smells more candied fruit, red fruit, almost like hard shell a raspberry candy type of thing. So it's really, fruit is the overriding factor on this. There isn't really a ton of earth on it. I don't really get a ton of oak characteristics on this. So this could be one of the less expensive wines. Wine number three, there's a little more character to this wine on the nose. There's a bit of, um, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, maybe a little syrup on this. Call me crazy, but it kind of smells like noodles, which I don't know. Yes, yeah, yeah, I know. There's something unusual about it. it there's something, there's some, I'm not saying it's off, but there's something unusual about it. Let's just see what it tastes like. like mm. So there's, that, that aroma kind of carried through, but there's a more richness to it. There's a little more caramel to it. Um, you got, you've got a little more black fruit on this, so more blackberry rather than raspberry. Um, there's a richness to it. I hate to say it, but there's something about paint that, that comes to mind with this. Not necessarily in a bad way, but there was something a little bit different about it. But it, really, it literally smells like ramen. I mean, it really does. It does taste really good, though. I'm not trying to wish that it's any particular wine. I just hope it's not certain wines. I don't want to be like all biased on it. Wine number four. So good balance between red and, red and black fruit. There's a brightness to the fruit. It's kind of have a similar aroma to wine number three there. But what I actually get is, um, and this happens not necessarily with cabs for me from Cali, but I do get kind of that bug spray thing. I do, I do also get that roasted coffee. So that usually is indicating some type of oak. Mm. There's a savoriness to this wine. There's a complexity to this wine. There's a richness to this wine. There's a depth to the wine. The, the fruit feels really ripe, but not like over the top ripe. And I don't, the alcohol is like, I have no idea what the alcohol actually is. I mean, it's really well integrated. Tannins are there. I, I'm actually detecting the tannins, whereas the other three, they, they didn't, I didn't come to mind so quickly. I'll go back through them, but there's a juiciness to it. It'd be really interesting to see which one this actually is. All right, point number five. Again, the red and black fruits. I feel like there's a little bit of green to it. More like a leafy, like fern type of thing. Not like, you know, not like bell, pe bell pepper and stuff like that, but there's probably something along those lines. Again, got that little bit of coffee in there. Tannins are big on this. There's a lot of structure to this wine. It's, it's a lot broader. The fruit's really jumping out now. And again, it's not that overripe thing. It's really, it's really well contained. But there's a, there's a great flavor. There's a great deliciousness to the fruit. Um, it's more black fruited than red fruited. You've got, you've got that vanilla. You've got a little bit of whiskey lactone going on here. I'm going to say it very likely had some new French or new oak on it, whether it was French, American, whatever. But I think there definitely was some new oak on this wine. Wine number six. So I haven't really talked about the color on these, but this one shows to be like it may have had some oxidation a little bit. So I have no idea which wine this is, but that might give me a clue to something. There's a touch of orange to it. You can kind of smell it a little bit. The fruit smells a little more dried not as lush and, and ripe as, as the others. There's more earth to this wine. There's a su sweet tobacco, there's more sweet fruit to it. It's ripe fruit, it's sweet fruit. The tobacco's there. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a herbaceousness to the savoriness, that's all, a little savoriness to it. 
It's really juicy. The oak characteristics, I don't know. I think they're there, but they're, they're, they're not over the top. So my initial thought as to what this wine was based on color, that may not be yet based upon the nose and the palate. However, I think there is oak on it. I think it's just really well integrated. Remember, I don't know the oak on some of these wines. The most expensive one, don't know, and the cheapest ones, I don't know. The middle three, we know something about, I don't know if these are the middle three, but the middle three price-wise, we know of some type of oak treatment on it. All right, so I, I kind of have a little bit of idea. I should have gotten a pen. Austin, would you be able to grab me a pen? Absolutely. I can kind of write some stuff down real quick. So I'm going to, thank you very much. Three, four, five, six. So right now I'm just kind of doing not a little test of things. What I'm looking for is complexity right now. I'm looking for structure. I'm looking for things that would lead me to believe that there might have been some oak aging going on here rather than just sat in a tank. Um, and then they bottled it and it sort of sat in a bottle for an extra amount of time. I'm also looking for balance. Is the one in balance? Is there anything that maybe jumps out a little more than it should? Whether it's alcohol, acid, tannin, any of that type of stuff. This one really confuses me because I'm not really sure what, what to make of that one. Okay, I think I've got some Okay, I think I got some uh, initial conclusions here, so I'm just kind of doing a little bit of fine tuning now. All right, so my initial ranking, I, I'm trying to go off of just what I think quality was, but at the same time, I'm thinking about the price point. So all these rankings are probably gonna be the same. And what do I like the best? That's, yeah, the first ranking is gonna be price and quality, because I think they both, wherever I think the quality is, I think that's what the price point is. But what do I like the best? So, <clears throat> I'm kind of, 
I've kind of, it's almost the same ranking, but I'm flipping a couple things here and there. All right, so I have an initial couple rankings and I hope and pray that I didn't completely F this up. They're all cabs. They all taste like cabs. There's definitely differences between the two. Do I think that one wine is 25 times better than another wine? Like, do I think, do I think how I've done the quality rating, I don't know. Because if you watch those other episodes, you know that at some point, it's about the reputation of the winery and it's about the real estate. It's not necessarily that the wine itself is gonna be that much better. Remember the, the car analogy. When you start getting into the upper echelon of cars, they're all about the same. I mean, the quality of workmanship is gonna be the same. The materials they're using are gonna be the same. It's a matter of what, what emblem you put on the front hood, okay? And what you like. You Ergonomically, you may like the Cadillac over the Mercedes, over the BMW, over the Lexus. You know, I mean, there's, there's things about preferences that we have. So, with that said, I think quality-wise, I think we go three, two, one, five, four, and six. What I like from least to most like is about the same. Three, two, one. I missed one, didn't I? Yes, I did. That goes there, that goes there. Three, two, one, four, five, six. So I flipped, I basically flipped four and five and uh, kept the other three the same. All right, so let's have the reveal, if you will, please. Ah, what do you know? Okay, so uh, the Murphy Good was wine number two. Hey, I nailed that one. All right, uh, let's, what's this one, this one? The Silver Ghost, ooh, wine number one. So that was wine number one. So I put that as number three, okay? Gravelly Meadow. Oh. That was not good. That was the one I rated the lowest. So we're gonna go back to that wine. The Barnett, uh, that is number four. And I rated that as either number four in, sorry, number five in quality or number four in preference. The Senegal, number five, that one was, I called four in quality, five in preference and the wow and the one i like the best the one i thought it was the best is the 19 dollars bottle of wine so what does that tell me i don't know what the hell i'm talking about i guess all right so let's go back to this wine number three and let's try wine number two again Thank you. I don't know what to tell you. This is, this is good wine, but for some reason, in this type of lineup and under the pressure of lights and trying to sound all important and, and smart, I rated it lower. Here's the thing. This is the one I, this is the one I thought was wine number six. I thought, I th the only number six is what I thought was the gravity metal. And the reason I thought that, because I thought I saw some oxidation, this being a half bottle, um, it oxidizes faster. So I let that influence what I thought it was. I'm not saying that I would have nailed it if I hadn't have done that, but there was something going on with this one. Even though I liked it the best, there was something different about it. 
So I don't know. I'm happy that the Senegal, being the second most expensive wine, was in the upper part of everything. And that the Barnett being the fourth most expensive, I expected these two to flip. I actually expected them to flip. I, I figured that they were going to be real close to each other. I had expected these two to be close, but yeah. And I didn't know where to, I didn't know where to put the Silver Ghost. I mean, initially in my head, I didn't know where it would, it would fit, but I mean, it's right about where it would be. It is the number three wine, and I, I put it, well, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. I got witnesses behind me that, that heard me say all that, all that stuff, and my conclusions didn't match. So I don't know what to tell you. Future Mark here. Okay, so queso? I like queso. At the risk of making this a longer episode, I felt that I needed to do this. Obviously, I ranked the most expensive and arguably the highest rated wine last, but did I? Here's the deal. Now that I've had almost two weeks as of writing this script, to mentally reevaluate this tasting and then watch the actual tasting, I have some observations as to how I ranked everything. So let me preface this with that I've had all the wines since the original tasting. I finished the Diamond Creek and the Murphy Good, and I actually finished the Silver Ghost today. In general, I did rank the wines mostly correct if you go by my descriptions of each wine. The fact that the Diamond Creek finished last is, I believe, due to poor execution of the tasting. What I failed to do was listen to what I was saying. More correctly, I failed to write down what I said. If I had done this one thing, I would have probably put the Diamond Creek at the top, no lower than second, no question in my mind. Let's review what I said, starting with the least expensive to the most expensive. All right. Red fruit, alcohol, candied, fruit overriding flavor, not much earth, not much oak, maybe one of the inexpensive wines. That was the Murphy Good at $10. The next most expensive, shows oxidation, no idea, but might be a clue, touch of orange as in color, smells oxidized, fruit dried, not as lush and ripe, more earth, sweet tobacco, sweet and ripe fruit, tobacco, herbaceousness, savory, juicy, Oak characteristics? I don't know. I think they're there, but not over the top. Quote, my initial thought as to what this wine was based on color, that may not be it, based upon the nose and the palate. End quote. I think there's oak on it, but really well integrated. All right, so on the first round of retasting, I commented that the wine really confused me, and I wasn't sure what to make of it. Now, this should have been a red flag for me. That was a Buena Vista at $19. All right, next one up. Red fruit, raspberry, blackberry, some oak, coffee, smoke, tastes good, same on the palate. Vanilla, clove, cinnamon. That was the Silver Ghost. I tasted it today. It was pretty good. 35 bucks. The next one up. Good balance, red and black fruit, brightness of fruit, similar aroma from three. That was the Diamond Creek wine. Bug spray, then bug spray again. Roasted coffee equals oak. Then I went, hmm, savoriness, complexity, richness, depth, ripe fruit, but not overripe. Alcohol is well integrated, tannin noticeable, juiciness. Interesting to see which one this is. That hmm was after I did the initial tasting. That was the Barnett at $80. Next one up, red and black fruits, green, leafy, fern, not bell pepper, coffee, tannin, big, lots of structure, broader, Fruit really jumping out, not overripe, well-contained. Great flavor and deliciousness of the fruit, more black than red. Vanilla, whiskey lactone, has new oak. The Senegal at $110. And then the final wine, the most expensive, more character to the wine. Syrup, noodles, unusual, hmm. Richness, caramel, black fruit, blackberry, more than raspberry. 
paint, another one that was kind of weird. Different, okay? Ramen, really good. Oh, sorry, tastes really good. Hope it's not certain wines. After the reveal, I quote, it's good wine. For some reason and under pressure, I rated lower than Murphy good. That was the Diamond Creek. It was the only other wine that I said, hmm, after tasting it. It was also the only one that I said tastes really good. I did say that the Senegal had great flavor and deliciousness to the fruit, and it should at 110 bucks. The ramen comment on the Diamond Creek really threw me off, and I, I think it soured me to the wine. Even though I said it tasted really good, also my comment, quote, I hope it's not certain wines, is a dead giveaway that I thought this was a very high quality wine, but I didn't remember saying that later on. As you saw, I was already thinking the last wine I had taste, that I had tasted was the Diamond Creek due to the noticeable oxidation. And that's more of a bottle issue than anything else. Like I mentioned, I have had all the wines since then. I haven't finished the middle four. Well, I did finish the Silver Ghost today. All the wines, when knowing what they are, seemed to taste as expected. I can say that myself, Scott, and Austin, that was Boodles in the video, all finished the Diamond Creek over a couple hour period that day. Yeah, we casually sipped on the remainder of a half bottle. The conclusion we came to as a group is that the Diamond Creek was a wine that needed canting for oxidation. Even though it's a half bottle, this wine needs more oxygen to open up properly. It wasn't a favorite style for one of them, but that person still said it was excellent. Napa cabs just aren't their jam, but they appreciate them. This need for time to open up was confirmed by a few people I told about the tasting. They've had more experience with Diamond Creek wines and have all said that they are best after at least 10 years of aging and or also decanting. Now, this is a cop-out, maybe, I know for certain that some styles and types of wine taste better with age. Some of my favorite wines are 20 and 30 year old Rieslings. I like young Riesling, but give me one with a couple decades of age and I'm all over it. I've had the 2016 Buena Vista a couple times since then and the oxidation is more prominent and it just doesn't taste that great. As I already mentioned, I've also tasted the other wines once or twice since then, and they all showed exactly how I described them. In all honesty, I think the Buena Vista would be considered a flawed bottle in an exam. Yes, flawed. Even though I scored it the highest in the final analysis, I had so convinced myself that it had to be a wine from a half bottle that I had forgiven this flaw. It's no one's fault this bottle was like that. It happens. I could have picked a different bottle two years ago and that bottle would have very likely been just fine. In hindsight, I should have eliminated that wine from the beginning and ranked the other five, but I didn't. I messed up, I made a rookie mistake, and I apologize for that. I felt pressured to push through. You can tell at the time I was doing the initial tasting that I wasn't super convinced this was the most expensive wine, even though I thought it showed the most oxidation. However, I let that influence me and I jumped to a conclusion. I've done this as have many Psalms many times when doing a blind flight of wines, a normal flight of six wines of six different wines where we have three white and three red. We've made up our minds about the type of wine and where it comes from before finishing the tasting. And you know what happens? We'll paint ourselves into a corner. Sometimes we'll get to our conclusion phase and realize this, but we've taken so much time at that point that we can't go back. This is because we are on a clock and have to finish all six wines in 25 minutes. That's not a lot of time. I actually did this set of six in 12 minutes and 18 seconds. I think this also contributed to making some errors in judgment. I felt pressured to finish quickly. Now, to be fair, there are some testable wines that are so obvious on just the nose that it can be only one grape. It then comes down to picking where in the world, uh, but these are really only a couple white wines. 
Everything else can have at least one to three other grapes or regions when it comes when it only comes to the nose. Sight can also indicate a few things, but you always have to smell and taste to confirm. Now, I did purchase a 2018 Buena Vista recently to try it. This is the most current release. This bottle showed no oxidation. It shouldn't at three years. Just like a full bottle uh, shouldn't really show the oxidation level I saw at five years, especially a Cali Cab. It tasted exactly as I would expect. A little harsh at first, but with lots of red and black fruit. As it opened up in the glass, it softened up a bit, but it was still all fruit with no real oak character. It tasted fine. It wasn't something I would get all like excited about for 18 to 20 bucks, but it was solid enough. I could recommend it to someone that didn't want to go over $20. It, it, it easily is better than the Murphy Good, but not as good as the Silver, as the silver Ghost. Uh, anyway, when looking at my notes, I did well in describing the wines. I believe that if I had actually written down all of it, my final ranking would have either exactly matched price or had been at least very close. The Barnett and the Senegal were the only ones that actually flipped in my initial rankings. That may have played out the same, or the Diamond Creek may have flipped with the Senegal in each ranking, and the Barnett may have stayed third in both rankings. The Senegal tasted like money. I didn't say it that way, but my comments indicated that the oak aging was the most obvious. It does have 85% new oak, so yeah, money. I can also say that both Scott and Austin thought I had nailed the wines from listening to my descriptions. Granted, they were half listening to what I was saying since they had actual work to do, but my comments seemed to match the wines. So to revisit the rankings without having the luxury of having written notes, I had ranked the wines in this order. First, Buena Vista. Second, the Barnett or the Senegal. Third, the Barnett or the Senegal. Fourth, Silver Ghost. Fifth, Murphy Good. And sixth, Diamond Creek. If I had done this correctly, written down what I had said, and eliminated the Buena Vista as a flawed bottle, this is the actual ranking based upon what I had said about each wine. First, either the Diamond Creek or the Senegal. Second, the Barnett or the Senegal or the Diamond Creek or the Senegal. And then third, the, the Barnett or the Senegal. Fourth, Silver Goes. Fifth, Murphy, Murphy Good. And I would have eliminated the Buena Vista. Having a chance to look at all this, I feel better about this tasting than I did that day. That day I was pretty depressed about my skill as a taster, a sommelier, and a critic. The feeling lasted a few days. Playing armchair quarterback, I can see that I had a flawed system. All right, back to the original show for my final thoughts. Is it all BS? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe I had a bad day tasting. I know I had a bad day tasting at tasting group today, and that I wasn't necessarily getting all the quality correct, though. Of the three that I had to be put on the clock, I at least identified the, the, the best of the three that I had to do. So there's that, at least. I don't know. It's embarrassing, honestly. And uh, I don't know. I think we're going to drink some Gravelly Meadow as, as a little bonus because, um, yeah. Drink what you like. That's the bottom line. And uh, yeah. I got nothing else. I guess we're going to end the show now because there's nothing else to talk about. I'm like really like flabbergasted. All right. Well, it's going to do it. What? Wine? Wine makes us all humble. Is that what you wrote? Yes. Wine makes us all humble. Um, yes. Uh, the scroll just happened. Anyway, you should know the routine by now. Uh, thank you for stopping by. Click links. Well, I don't really, you know, there'll be links below. Tell your friends about it. The best wine show anywhere, like completely had an epic fail. And I'm human. Later.